Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. We are really excited for being able to kick off this 2021 with today's topic on how subnational regions can drive the transition to a circular labor market. My name is Luis Sosa. I'm the research analyst of the Circular Jobs Initiative at Circle Economy. Uh, we are delighted to be joined today by our three expert speakers. Burju Tonger, Head of Circular Development and Global Coordinator for ICLEI, Chris Bacchus, Research Manager at the HIVA Research Institute of the KU Leuven, and Fiona Craig, Education and Skills Managers for Zero Waste Scotland. Also by our two members of the panel, Catherine Stevens from Circular Flanders, Etienne Engers uh, from RISIC Quebec, and Soiler from Highlands and Icelands Enterprise. I would also like to thank uh, the Gold Schmidt Foundation who supports this event and in general the work undertaken by the Circular Jobs Initiative. Our today's topic focuses on the importance of subnational regions and local governments in facilitating the transition to a circular economy and the circular labor markets. We must start saying that uh, national governments have a powerful role to play in the design and implementation of roadmaps and circular economy strategies. They have the mandate to develop national legislation and can create an enabling environment and incentives to drive the circular transition and are the leading actors in national, supranational, and multilateral coordination. However, uh, circularity is also strongly embedded in subnational regions and local economies. Regions can bring governance systems closer to their communities and actively engage all relevant stakeholders to support access and uh, broader participation. They can easily also understand the public demands and could be in a better position to respond to some of them. These advantages are not only relevant for the transition to a circular economy, they also come into play for the design of recovery plans to address the devastating consequences of the COVID-19 pandemic for the labor market, where thousands of people have lost their jobs and many businesses are at risk of not opening again. Perhaps part of the response of some national regions could be based on the incorporation of circular economy strategies into their policy instruments. We would love to hear more about this happening around the world, honestly. Being said that, uh, I'm really keen to hear what our experts can uh, tell us about the role of some national regions as policy actors and leading that transition to circularity. So without further introduction and moving now on to our agenda and to unpick this topic. Uh, each of our two expert speakers will give a short opening presentation. This will be followed by a panel discussion and Q&A of 30 minutes, sort of. In the first place, we have Burju Tonger, who will talk about what role can subnational regions play in driving labor market development in the circular economy. This will be done from an international perspective and uh, from the experience that ICLEI has working with in many contexts worldwide. Burku will be followed by Chris Bacchus, who will present us uh, how can regional approaches ensure a just transition to the circular economy. HIVA has worked extensively in the region of Flanders and in 2018, they did research on the potential of the transition to a circular economy. Chris' presentation will bear us on that. And finally, we have Fiona Craig, who will talk us through the research that Zero Waste Scotland and Circle Economy did for Scotland last year. The name of her presentation is How Can Regions Provide the Skills Needed for the Circular Economy? Right after the presentation, we will have a panel discussion uh, where we will also receive questions from our audience. It is important to mention that uh, in the Sorry, uh, it is important to mention that in the panel, we have the presence of experts that work in Flanders and Scotland. That is the case of Catherine and Zoe Lert, respectively. And in that sense, we hope the presentations will give inspiration to have a fruitful panel discussion. A brief note on housekeeping. Uh, we will save all questions to the panel discussion and Q&A. So please post any questions you have for our panelists into the chat, chat box below uh, at the bottom of, of your screen and indicate who you are directing your question to. This event is being recorded and so please express any issues you have uh, with this in the chat box, please. 
Uh, please remain all muted uh, unless I invite you to take the microphone during the Q&A. And finally, if you experience any technical issues, please post this in the chat box and our team will help you as the best as they can. Uh, so now uh, I would like to hand it over to Burju Tanjo, Head of Circular Development and Global Coordinator for ICLE. Burju, uh, go ahead, please. Thank you very much, Luis. Good afternoon, Europe. Good morning to North America and good after, uh, well, evening, I think, to Asia. Um, I'm seeing, uh, well, also Africa. Good afternoon. I'm seeing uh, quite an international audience. So um, it's extreme pleasure for me to talk to everyone interested in the topic of circular economy and the potential it has for local economic development. Well, as we said, I am representing ICLE, uh, and we can already go to the next slide, perhaps, Luis. ICLE is a, and the next one, is a network of uh, local governments for sustainability. It's already 30 plus years old, and um, we have a vast network of uh, uh, members, almost now reaching 2,000 um, around the world in 100 plus countries. Our mission is um, to bring good life uh, to the dwellers, residents of uh, cities, um, regions, uh, through different pathways. And um, ICLE has always worked towards um, climate-friendly, biodiversity-rich cities. Uh, but in time, the way um, and the pathways for reaching there has evolved, and circular economy has become one of them. Um, if you can go to the next one, Luis, please. Um, just to mention, and along the presentation, I will refer to some of those offices. We have many offices around the world. So um, where I'm sitting is the World Secretariat in Bonn, that we have a coordination role. So I'm the head of circular development. And uh, we have many offices in the offices um, in 26, um, so to say, working with uh, cities in um, resource efficiency and circular economy efforts. Uh, so we'll be happy to connect uh, with our audience also at the local level. And please, if you can go to the next one. As I said, uh, at ICLE, um, we, as a strategy, um, we have uh, about two years ago decided to work, uh, focus on pathways that are all entangled uh, with each other. Um, so low, low emission development is uh, towards climate neutral cities and we have already 500 committed to that, but uh, you cannot reach low emission development just working on renewable energy infrastructure, but you need to also make it inclusive, uh, equitable, and also you need to look into the um, carbon embedded in products and services in the cities, almost like 50% of that carbon needs to be managed as well. So that's why circular economic development, circular development, as we call it, is very much linked to low emission development. And all this has to uh, lead to establishment of an economic structure that's resilient. And of course, people-centered. So we need to look into the jobs, and this is one of the most important uh, motivating factor. That's why we uh, are very proud our partnership with Circle Economy on this, that we like to bring uh, convincing arguments that this pathway has uh, a lot of potential for job retention and creation. And Circle Economy is a new economy, and uh, we need to perhaps lose some jobs of the old economy but we need to create new jobs. And I think today I'd like to just uh, start this exciting um, round of discussions by giving a few uh, perhaps examples on how we can do this. If we can go to the next one, please. Um, so in, in general, just to mention that uh, when we talk about circular economy in the cities, the first thing that comes to mind in the leather is waste management because that's a natural uh, entry point for cities. Um, it's one of their utility services. But uh, in time, we see uh, lots of, uh, of course, potential also in resource efficiency in the industries active in the city, 
in the SMEs, in small businesses, uh, from services like tourism sector to manufacturing sector. Then we go up and see that uh, in the ladder of uh, resource efficiency hierarchy or resource management hierarchy, that we can keep all these products and materials in the economy, the local economy, longer in use. Like the extension life of the infrastructure in the city, longer use of uh, the office spaces, uh, using materials that uh, last longer in the construction, uh, in, in many other sectors or in the consumer goods that we use every day in the city. Also uh, models, new business models, uh, uh, using eco-design thinking, uh, rethinking how we establish businesses like um, sharing, uh, thinking of new ownership models comes into play. And finally, thinking um, the city as a metabolism, as an urban metabolism, where um, we not only protect the resources, but regenerate. Uh, through nature-based solutions, also uh, looking into synergies with the nature is very important to us. So just want to say that it, like, it's not only about waste management, but it's, it's a whole uh, systems thinking. And at each of these steps, we have lots of opportunities for new business creation and jobs. So, but uh, maybe taking one step uh, back and going to the next slide, um, as I'm speaking first, I, it's important to mention, I think um, today we're talking about local and regional governments. Um, why are they so critical in creating jobs? So just, just on that, to set the stage, um, we know that national and supranational governments, um, uh, like our ministries, are responsible uh, to look at the macroeconomic issues. Talking about circular economy, they, they really define the macroeconomic rules of the game. And they do uh, write laws. They, uh, of course, manage huge infrastructure projects. They look into global, also influence global value chains through international trade agreements. But when it comes to really um, setting the rules of the game for the production and consumption activities in the city, in the local area, um, it's really the, um, our municipalities, our mayors, our local governments uh, playing a role. So they can set the rule and um, they can really work with the communities and business to uh, turn those um, national um, rules of the game into um, really local, um, into, to, to uh, adapt them to the local needs and uh, visions. So uh, we see a lot of uh, also um, guidelines and plans happening like the climate uh, neutrality plans, uh, resource management plans. Um, we know circular economy plans of cities uh, happening. So um, they can very much influence and work with the stakeholders. Uh, and how? Um, one thing is of course the uh, own infrastructure in the city. So all the uh, public transport, the built environment, waste water uh, management systems, but not only that, also management of uh, the education system, the schools, and what happens there in terms of um, uh, the way that we decide about products and services, um, education of this uh, generation, and also the uh, public health services that we experience today um, with the COVID-19 crisis, and they have a huge uh, facilitation and decision-making role. And um, the last point is that, um, they have the um, role to convene uh, private sector uh, enterprises, uh, uh, players uh, from uh, big industries, manufacturers, uh, uh, even, even international uh, investors to uh, small uh, businesses, informal businesses often. Uh, for example, um, in many of our cities in Africa, 70% of economic activity is informal and cities have to uh, cater to this reality when they think about circular jobs as well. So eventually creation of livelihoods where jobs are created and uh, families uh, benefiting uh, from them. And um, if we turn this into a practical maybe implication, how ECLA works, um, maybe we can go to the next slide is that we um, understand um, the interventions uh, through these uh, six areas. 
So as I said, uh, the first area, if you look, I want to give a few examples to make it a bit more concrete. Uh, how we can create uh, green and circular jobs is certainly through circular urban infrastructure. Um, that we can see the urban space development, like in Tanzania, Dar es Salaam, uh, creation of urban um, agriculture systems uh, has been very practical for creation of thousands of jobs uh, by catering um, the food, by analyzing the food provision system and uh, setting up structures for um, food growth, uh, even organic food growth in the city. Um, Secondly, very uh, urban infrastructure, I think, of course, I think we will hear also cases later on, is very much related to construction and building sector. And we have great examples coming from Europe, uh, especially on um, subsidies, um, for example, recently in Catalan government, um, in Amsterdam, uh, also other member cities that we have uh, having um, really interventions to foster um, innovations in the construction sector or uh, through municipal services, city services, um, such as, as I said, waste management, uh, engagement uh, with the social enterprises, giving them the space uh, for collection uh, segregation, like the Quezon city in the Philippines, um, or it could be uh, related to their direct uh, intervention, such as green public procurement. Um, in Baltimore, um, we know that uh, Waste to Wealth program has created also thousands of jobs through, um, again, the devolution, uh, waste uh, reuse in the construction of uh, urban space, plus um, also public procurement program they have in the Quezon City, for example, set up of um, green uh, energy, uh, po um, solar power, uh, provision in the uh, public schools uh, that they have, that they created these jobs uh, through uh, a shift in their public procurement scheme. And uh, looking into the, um, the hard um, core of uh, circular economy, really industrial development, um, supporting eco-industrial parks, um, supporting clusters of businesses, material exchange services, um, we see that uh, through our um, pilots, for example, in Bogor, most probably textile sector, food sector, we will be looking into these opportunities. Also looking into integration of SMEs uh, into global value chains and um, really catalyzing those relations with investors, uh, cities have a role to play. And um, obviously the fourth point, uh, supporting entrepreneurs, but not only um, entrepreneurship or startups as such, but eco-innovative uh, green entrepreneurs through um, working with universities, opening up incubators, giving um, spaces to entrepreneurs at low cost can create a lot of opportunities, uh, create jobs. Like we see uh, Turku uh, consciously nurturing the startup ecosystem through our cir uh, 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 circular Turku uh, project. And uh, finally, um, social entrepreneurship or informal uh, sector support, as we know in the e-waste sector, um, formalization of um, uh, e-waste workers in Bangalore, for example, um, where there is a national uh, directive on waste electrical electronic equipment is implemented at the city level by uh, engaging with informal workers and enabling uh, them setting up uh, really formalized cooperatives. Um, and at the household practices level, matching um, the equinovative products with uh, the consumer's uh, demand, uh, so playing more like a market pool effect in the city is very powerful and encourages uh, establishment of new businesses. So to sum up, um, not to take uh, so much time of other experts, if we can go to the next slide, um, what we do at ICLE now, um, concretely, that we'll be happy to discuss also further, is that uh, working with UNEP uh, colleagues, United Nations Environment Program and Circular Economy colleagues, we look into uh, evidence-based um, analysis of where the uh, circular jobs opportunities can be. Uh, I think we will see an application of this uh, methodology uh, shortly. Uh, but we look into uh, the development um, 
part of it more in, uh, for example, city of Bogor in Indonesia. And uh, we have our uh, Indonesian office also on the call and uh, a representative from Bogor, uh, where we are looking into now um, how we can really uh, support uh, through stakeholder engagement circular jobs. And this methodology helps uh, analyze the uh, priorities and um, uh, tourism sector, uh, manufacturing sector, and food sector we see as opportunities. And finally, I hear from my colleagues, also from the Indonesia office, is that demonstration and really um, showing the benefits behind is um, the key to replication. So uh, we're looking into um, hopefully also learning from this webinar, replicating to other cities uh, of ICLE and working collaboratively um, in making those benefits clear. Um, so thank you very much, uh, Luis. I think with this, um, the last slide that if you'd like to contact us, uh, we'll be happy to um, discuss with you further work on replicating circular jobs. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Burjo. Uh, thank you for the really clear overview of the international perspective on this topic. I think it's, it is great to see how ICLE approaches this economic development for local communities and regions. I really like the mapping of, of policies, instruments uh, available for, for local and regional governments uh, and the examples as well. So I think it's really great. Thank you so much. Uh, and now I would like to invite Chris uh, Bacchus, research manager uh, at the Hiva Research Institute of KU Lubin. Uh, Chris will talk to us about uh, how can regional approaches ensure a just transition to the circular economy using Hiva's uh, vast experience working in the region of Flanders. Welcome, Chris, uh, the floor is all yours. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Louis, for this kind uh, introduction. So I suggest we immediately move on uh, to the next uh, slide because all the rest have been set, uh, has been set in your introduction. Uh, in fact, given the fact that uh, our time is limited, I would also like to, uh, to skip this slide. You will see all these points uh, passing by during the presentation quite, uh, quite soon. So let's start uh, immediately with uh, some introduction to the studies I would like to present to you. Uh, in 2018, we conducted this study uh, in the framework of the Flemish Policy Research Center on Circular Economy. And uh, the study had two uh, main objectives. First one was to uh, take a look at the current uh, employment in circular sectors in Flanders. So mapping the characteristics of these jobs and also estimating the numbers of uh, circular jobs in Flanders. And uh, a second, in the second part of the study, we also took a look at the future and we made an estimate for the uh, future potential of uh, job uh, creation in the circular economy for uh, the region of uh, Flanders. Next, please. Uh, before I delve into the studies, I think uh, it is necessary to give you uh, some uh, crash course in the Belgian federal system. Uh, ideally, I would need around three hours to uh, give you a full idea of how it works. But uh, given uh, time restrictions, I will uh, condense it to one or two minutes. Uh, and obviously, I will focus only on the, on the very basics uh, of it. In fact, I think the, the most important point, which also distinguishes our federal system from many others, is the fact that we are, uh, the, the, ex the competences we have are so-called exclusive competences, which means that there is no hier hierarchic uh, difference between uh, the federal entities, as we call them. They are all at the same level. It also means that uh, if one, um, competence uh, or area uh, is uh, in, the, in the regional level, for instance, then the federal government has no saying whatsoever, no levers or instruments to overrule uh, the regions. So that's an important uh, difference with many other federal uh, systems. Um, in the past 40 years, we've had uh, about six, as we call, state reforms. In each case, a number of competences were transferred from the federal level to mainly the regional uh, levels. And this has resulted in a situation currently where uh, if you look at circular jobs uh, and, and the areas, the policy areas that are most relevant to, for studying this, uh, which in my view are environmental field and the labor uh, field, then the conclusion is that um, these competences are predominantly regional 
competences. So not at the federal level, but at the regional uh, level, uh, Flam at the Flemish level in our, in our case. I'm saying predominantly and not exclusively because of course competences, um, the large areas are like divided in all kinds of smaller competences. And some of them are still at the federal level to make it a bit more complicated, obviously. Like for instance, fiscal policy is still at the federal level, including labor, uh, labor taxation. Uh, we have uh, product standards uh, policies uh, that are still at, uh, at the federal level. And we also have social security uh, issues, including uh, unemployment allowances, for instance, that are also still at the federal uh, level. So it's a bit more complicated than that, but it's quite safe to conclude that in general, I would say about 90% of the relevant competences that are needed to develop circular jobs policies in Flanders are at the Flemish regional uh, level. Um, moreover, I would also even say that in the past couple of years, quite recently, that the topic of circular jobs has also grown out to, to, to become uh, a, a priority in, in Flemish uh, policy plans, uh, which is pushed um, on the one hand by the Ministry of the Environment, but also uh, by the Ministry of uh, Economy and uh, Work. Next slide, please. Now let's go have a look at, uh, at the study. Uh, first of all, I want to say that we based our um, quantitative estimates of current employment levels in the circular economy on the so-called uh, NACE uh, codes, classification codes. Uh, these are activity codes, sector codes, uh, if you like, uh, describing uh, the activities that companies do. Uh, the, 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 the good side of this approach is that there's a lot of uh, statistics available on this level because companies are required to report a lot of data on this level. But it also has a downside that it was, among others, that it was not designed at all to distinguish the circular economy inside the, the, the economy. And therefore, it's quite hard to say which uh, NACE codes should be considered uh, part of the circular economy and which should not be considered part of a circular economy. And uh, we took on what we would call a scientifically uh, safest uh, approach, which means that uh, this is a very conservative approach. And we only included a sector as part of the circular economy if we deemed it as fully circular. And, but of course, in reality, many sectors, um, for instance, the, the construction sector, they, they have like a mix of, of uh, more circular uh, activities and maybe not so circular activities. But in the end, uh, to be, to be uh, scientifically correct, we decided not to include such um, kind of hybrid uh, sectors. So the result of this is that the results I'm about to show you are uh, probably in reality uh, underestimates of, uh, of the real situation. Next slide, uh, please. So I will show you three of the results of the uh, quantitative study on the current employment. Uh, the first one is on the growth rates. We um, observed or we concluded that the growth rate in what we called circular sectors uh, in the period that we studied between 2010 and 2016 was around double the average uh, um, employment growth in the whole of the Flemish um, economy. So it's, uh, it's safe to conclude that circular economy is a, clearly a growth uh, sector and obviously we expect it to remain that way uh, at least in the near future. Next slide, please. Um, the second observation we made in our study is that the circular economy in Flanders is a predominantly male sector. Uh, not, no less than 85% of the employees um, in the circular economy are men. And obviously it's quite clear it can be linked to some types of the activities, uh, a relatively large uh, proportion of, of manual uh, labor, um, some, some waste sectors, waste related sectors, which are typically associated with uh, men execute, executing these uh, tasks. Next slide, please. And the third uh, result on current employment levels is uh, on the uh, education level of the people working in the Flemish circular economy. And there the conclusion is that the circular economy in Flanders is predominantly a sector, uh, or at least ma uh, for majority, uh, a sector for uh, people with low skilled profile. We can see it from, from this graph. Unfortunately, the graph had to use uh, different uh, databases, so the numbers are not perfectly comparable. 
uh, but we, here we should only take a look at the two uh, last uh, sets of bars. So for CE total and Flanders, and for CE total, if we have a look at the low skilled proportion of uh, the workers in the sector, that would be the sum of the purple bars and some proportion around 33, uh, between 33 and 50% of the light blue bars uh, added up together with the purple ones uh, would make out the, the, the low skilled labor in the circular economy. And that can be compared with the numbers for Flanders, where there's only one figure, which are the blue bars. Uh, so the blue bars represent the low skilled labor in the general uh, economy. And the conclusion we could make is that uh, indeed it is uh, comparatively uh, compared to the general economy, there are uh, a larger proportion of jobs uh, aimed at low skilled uh, profiles. Next slides, please. So in the second part of the study, uh, we uh, took a look at the future and we estimated the employment potential uh, for the year 2030 in uh, Flanders. Uh, we used the methodology of input-output analysis uh, based on a previous study carried out by uh, TNO. And like they did, we also used uh, one sector uh, specifically, which is the metal electro sectors. And based on estimates for that sector, we uh, made an extrapolation for uh, other circular uh, sectors. And the results of this uh, exploratory study uh, is that um, 30,000 additional uh, circular jobs are expected to be uh, created by uh, 2030 in Flanders. And to give you an idea of the magnitude of 30,000 jobs, is it a lot or not? This is about 1% of current total employment. So if this means additional growth of 1%, obviously it's it's. It's a, it's a significant uh, growth, we could, uh, we could say. And the growth can be uh, found in uh, many sectors, not only the, the sectors that we labeled as circular, but in all kinds of sectors, as you can see uh, listed here. Next slide, please. And then uh, we obviously also took a look more specifically at the, uh, what we called circular sectors. And not surprisingly, uh, a number of uh, circular economy strategies, uh, like the far four, five R's or seven R's um, are, are uh, coming to the surface here, like uh, repair, uh, waste management, like recycling, restoration of buildings and secondhand uh, goods uh, sale. Next slide, please. Okay, um, as I said before, this was a, an exploratory study and it's important to highlight that there are a number of limitations uh, to, to the methodology. The first one I already mentioned, the, the NACE uh, code limitations. Uh, other limitations are that we did not take into account the bio-based part of the circular uh, economy and that our estimates are based on one sector, which obviously is not a, not a perfect approach uh, for estimates for, uh, for all circular uh, sectors. Uh, furthermore, uh, input-output analysis, uh, which is the uh, methodology, the modeling methodology we used, is known not to be the best one for forward-looking uh, studies. We have other more sophisticated uh, modeling techniques who are more suitable for that, but who are more comprehensive and take much more time to, uh, to unroll. Uh, like general equilibrium uh, modeling would be a better, uh, a better approach. But in fact, uh, based on the outcomes of this study, we took the initiative to, uh, to write a proposal together with the Flemish Institute for Technological Research uh, in, in Flanders and also involvement of circle economy to write a proposal for a new, uh, bigger, uh, larger four-year project, which was approved and which is now in the starting phase, uh, which also uh, Circular Flanders, uh, also represented in the, in the panel, is also part of this project. And we hope to, uh, or we're sure we will be able to develop more detailed and more scientifically robust uh, results and details for circular jobs in uh, Flanders based on this new uh, project. A final comment uh, is that we believe However important modeling approaches are for this type of studies, uh, we believe that ideally it should be supplemented with uh, other types of research, more qualitative types like uh, case studies, sector studies, uh, etc. And this is exactly also what uh, we are doing in this new, uh, uh, this new starting project. Next slide, uh, please. So coming to some uh, conclusions and uh, final observations. So it is clear that the circular economy is expected to be a net job creator for the future. And secondly, that many of these jobs will be fit for low skilled, especially male 
uh, profiles or, or workers. And in fact, these two elements sound uh, in general like music into the ears of ministers of uh, employment, uh, because um, it, in this way, with these results, uh, the circular economy may contribute to combating unemployment, uh, because these uh, profiles, low-skilled male profiles, are often uh, considered to be uh, vulnerable profiles on the labor uh, market. So uh, other observation is, uh, as I said before, that uh, Flanders is very well equipped, has all the tools and levers to design its own strategic circular economy jobs uh, policies, which in fact it is doing quite actively uh, now, and I'm sure you will hear some more about it uh, in the panel uh, discussion. However, on the other hand, uh, although Flanders has most of the levers in their own hands, in a federal system it is always um, an improvement if you work together with the federal level and with the other uh, regionals, uh, regions in, uh, in the country. It would indeed further strengthen the agenda because some elements are still elsewhere. Uh, but in Belgium, and then this is a bit of a reality check, unfortunately, uh, interfederal cooperation is not, the, it's not very easy. Uh, in fact, it's quite hard. We know from experience from other policy fields, including climate change, that um, it's, yeah, uh, if we want, we need to find agreements between six uh, governments who all have their own parliaments and elected governments. Uh, so coming to national policies would involve uh, all these, uh, these levels. And that uh, we know by experience that this is very hard. So once if one day the, the circle economy agenda is put at a higher level, maybe with some more binding uh, targets um, issued by the European Union, then uh, I think there will be some specific challenges that, uh, for Belgium that are linked to its uh, federal uh, system. Um, on the other hand, on the positive, uh, as a positive note, uh, I'm observing that uh, a lot of good dynamics are going on at the Flemish level. Uh, I think the ministers of the environment and the minister of uh, economy and work are actually cooperating quite well to push forward the strategic uh, agenda. And uh, it's, it's really growing as a priority policy field. And finally, um, although this political discussion is yet to be started formally, uh, I expect that circular economy and circular economy activities and jobs will also play an explicit role in, uh, in, in post-COVID-19 uh, recovery plan. Uh, well, in fact, I should say post-COVID-19 recovery plans. Uh, obviously, in Belgium, I expect more than one recovery plan will be constructed, one for each level, uh, probably. Uh, so, and and uh, this dynamic, this new element, uh, combined with the Green Deal, which is also not included in the studies we did uh, either, uh, combined could maybe lead to uh, to a further acceleration of of this agenda which is not calculated in our in the studies we did uh, in the past uh, before so i'm quite optimistic that uh, the agenda will uh, advance quite quite quickly in the next uh, coming uh, months and years so i think this was my last slide uh, louis uh, i look forward to all your questions and uh, comments and uh, thanks a lot for uh, for your attention Thank you so much, Chris. Indeed, it's really interesting to hear about your, your research uh, at the regional level in Flanders. Uh, as you mentioned before, and I, I would like to highlight again the two findings of your report, the fact that the circular economy can be considered the male sector, and in second place, uh, how it's also considered like a low skilled sector. It's really important to pay attention to those facts because uh, if we want to set better working conditions within the circular economy for vulnerable groups, you, you already mentioned it. And also those traditionally distant uh, from the labor market, it's important to address this, this, this type of facts. Thank, thank you again, uh, Chris. Um, I would like now to invite uh, Fiona Craig, who is Education and Skills Manager for Zero Waste Scotland. Fiona's presentation bears on how can regions provide the skills needed for the circular economy. Uh, she will use our collaboration launched last year. Uh, welcome, Fiona. Uh, the floor is yours. Go you ahead, please. Thank you very much, Louie. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for inviting me along today to tell you a little bit about our work here at uh, Zero Waste Scotland. First of all, Zero Waste Scotland is a national organisation 
and we exist to lead Scotland to use products and resources responsibly, focusing on where we can have the greatest impact on climate change. We do that through four key outcomes as contained in our, our corporate uh, strategy, which is about responsible consumption, and that's about respecting the limits of our natural resources, responsible production, which is about getting the maximum life and value from the natural resources um, used to make products uh, and, and materials. And also it's about maximizing value from waste and energy uh, too. So the, we are essentially the, the lead agency in Scotland funded by Scottish government and European money um, to, to lead Scotland in the context of a transition uh, to a circular economy in the, in the context of a net zero economy. Um, before I go in a little bit to tell you about the research that, that we, we, we did and published um, last year, I think it's important just to note and highlight that um, there, although Scotland is part of the United Kingdom, the UK, there are different uh, context and responsibilities between the UK and Scottish government. So we call this devolved matters. So some things Scottish government are responsible for and some things UK government are responsible for. So um, in terms of education skills and economic development, the infrastructure approach, decision, decision making, uh, planning, policy delivery and so on are very different in Scotland. Um, sorry, Louis, um, could you move to the, the next slide? I'm forgetting to, to, to say that. Sorry, so, so these devolved matters uh, on the left hand side, Scottish Government, um, these are Scottish Government have responsibility for these and on the right, um, UK, so, so there's, there can be a split in context and, and so on. So what I'm going to describe today is a Scottish context and applies in Scotland. Next slide, I remember to say it this time. Um, so in, in terms of uh, the Scottish context, one way um, uh, uh, in which we, we kind of try and join up, if you like, the skills agenda is through the, the uh, creation of an enterprise and skills strategic board. Uh, this was created two or three years ago and reports in through a uh, Scottish government. And all the agencies in the bottom, the agency boards are enterprise and skills agencies that look after, um, you know, the skills agenda, the learning agenda in, in Scotland. So it's very much about trying to join these things up um, in Scotland. And Zoe, who's on the panel later from Highlands and Islands Enterprise, um, certainly, as you can see in the bottom right, Highlands and Islands Enterprise, and can explain really how we are trying to, to have a sort of whole system and collaborative approach uh, among these agencies to align work um, with the strategic purpose of driving productivity, inclusive economic growth, and have a flexible, create a flexible, agile, responsive skill system to meet the challenges presented by climate change, uh, by demographic, environmental, technological change, and as has said, been said by the other speakers, these um, newer, wider challenges in relation to pandemic, uh, for us, Brexit, and green recovery strategies. Next slide, please. Um, so I, I won't uh, go into much detail on this, but we do have national, regional and sector skills planning and it happens across those agencies reporting to the strategic board. So it's how we develop um, skills and, and, and education in Scotland uh, across those different levels that will help meet the needs um, of our transition, not only to a more circular economy, but also in terms of, a, as I say, an, an net zero uh, economy. So, for example, we um, have skills action plans for sectors, we have skills action plans for regions, 
um, and we bring that in together with labour market intelligence and skills identification in a national skills alignment model. So in short, we have a top down approach, a bottom up and, and across to try and identify the kind of skills, needs and planning that we need to do um, to, to enable these uh, transitions to, to happen. So um, in terms of, next slide please, sorry. Um, so in terms of how do we influence the education and skills system uh, at regional level, um, Zero Way Scotland uh, did a piece of research which was published in, in October 2020 called The Future of Work, Baseline Employment Analysis and Skills Pathways for the Circular Economy in Scotland. And we did this in collaboration with Circle Economy. It was groundbreaking in that it's the first uh, assessment, baseline assessment, uh, of the number of jobs in Scotland that are related to the circular economy. And it also um, explored three particular areas of what we call value chains. Um, these are construction, capital, equipment, and bioeconomy. Um, regarding the types of skills and roles that perhaps we'll need to develop to accelerate the transition to a circular economy. And the, the link to the, the research is, is there for you to explore later. Next slide, please. So what, what um, we found uh, at a national level is that 8.1% 8 of jobs in Scotland are related to circular economy. And I won't go into any detail here, but we very much um, use the classification, circular economies, really helpful classification that, that enable us to, to, to come up with these um, figures. And as I say, this is the first time this has been done in Scotland. Um, it's also available to, to see on a Circle Economy's Jobs Monitor, which um, I'm sure we can send the, the, the link to. And it shows that actually Scotland, through this analysis, Scotland is on a par with the Netherlands and, and Belgium and, and so on. And as I say, we didn't know this before. We now know this, and this is um, our baseline for then maybe looking at this in, in, in the future. So that gives us really good data to, to enable us to, to do that. I, I won't read out the statistics you can see there. Uh, next slide, please. So um, we also were able then to look at uh, how this uh, was structured on, on a regional basis. In Scotland, there are 32 local authority areas uh, and uh, we, we have regional structures, as I mentioned before, for example, highlands and islands, it's the north and, and all the islands in, in, in Scotland. And we're able to determine um, how many jobs there were per region. And these fell in to a sort of between seven and 9.8%. There was no, no region that fell below or, or was above that. So, so it, was, it, it was a good um, uh, way to actually look at, well, wh what's the distribution of this um, a, a across Scotland? Uh, and this uh, study was able to, to, to show us that. And I, as I say, it's, it's on the, the jobs monitor, but you can go in and have a look at that yourself. Next slide, please. So in, in the second part of the study, we, we looked at these value chains, these three specific ones. And these were the ones that we thought offered the most potential in Scotland regard, regarding growth and transition to circular economy. So these are more from a, a sector point of view rather than a, a geographic regional point of view. But you have to rethink, um, you have to, to look at both. Just to emphasize, these aren't the only three. These happen to be the three that we decided to look at in this uh, report. And there may be further work uh, following this, the, this initial report. Um, next slide, please. So first of all, construction. Uh, within the construction uh, value chain, we specifically looked at off-site construction. We looked at di di digital technology uh, in terms of building and materials management and also closed loop 
uh, cycling of building materials. And what we found was that 2.7% of construction jobs are related to the circular economy, which um, uh, came, came into 1.8% of all jobs uh, within the, the baseline assessment. Next slide, please. Um, so when we looked at the, the value chain and uh, uh, circular economy, uh, came up with these lovely infographics, which um, I, I think really explain um, how, how we're, we've approached this. But when, when we looked at the value chain, we, we looked at where the materials started, uh, how the materials were used and how um, at, at the end of their life, the, the material was, was deconstructed. And then we looked at the different roles needed um, to help realise the circular economy in Scotland. So when we say um, roles, we, we don't mean job titles, but more like functions and um, particular tasks that people have to do. So when, when we looked at off-site um, construction, um, we, we looked at, well, we need to produce more buildings in factories rather than traditionally on construction sites externally. We looked at that as a new style of construction and perhaps new rules required. So we realised you need more people in sort of factory settings um, in order to, to build uh, off-site construction. So that could mean perhaps more local jobs for people, um, more uh, or, or less risky jobs in terms of construction, certainly in the UK and Scotland, can be quite a risky occupation to have and safety and, and health is, is, is quite, can be quite difficult. Um, it can also maybe change the demographic, as uh, Chris mentioned, you know, circular economy is, seems to be um, male. Uh, dominated, if you like, well, maybe, you know, off-site construction, and, and that's the same for Scotland, construction, very much a male occupation. Maybe we can change the, the demographic there um, and if, if uh, we're um, using more kind of factory-based off-site um, construction uh, methodology. So it could be more attractive. And then what we found was that we needed people with multi-skilled operatives. So um, maybe we need less specialised trades, as we call trades, um, on, on a construction site and more people with different types of variety of skills needed to, to do the assembly. And then we looked at, well, if these are the types of roles, the types of skills, then the qualifications and what we'd be looking for the qualifications. So we did this um, talking to industry um, and, and, and getting there, you know, we very much engaged with, with industry within this. Could you have the next slide, please? We also did this um, in, in terms of deconstruction. So we looked at all, you know, deconstruction auditors, urban miners and, and, and so on. And one of the other, uh, roles with, for example, material scouts and what would a material scout have to do? So if we can't always use raw materials, um, brand new materials, then what materials do we have? Where are they? How do we identify them? What can they be used for? Um, can, can we advise people who are looking for materials and where to get them and how to source them and, and broker that? And how perhaps we can advise people to use materials in, in a more sustainable way. Um, so that's, that's another example of, of uh, the, the value chain and, and the particular part of it. Could you have the next slide, please? And we also looked at uh, facility managers, asset managers, and we looked at the types of tasks that may, they might have to do. And um, certainly the BIM, which is a building information management, is, is a digital tool, which, for example, prevents you from over ordering materials for your project. Um, but that the take up of that in Scotland isn't high. So we need to encourage much more digital literacy 
And certainly the construction industry has not really embraced digital literacy. And, and that in itself is, is a high level skill that we, we identified through, through the study. We also need um, people in, in these kind of roles to think about analysing the design uh, of, of the, the project uh, within construction to make it more sustainable. And also when it comes to procuring materials as well within construction to make sure that we're procuring them with sustainability in, in, in mind. Um, next slide, please. So in terms of some of the skills implications, um, this is a, a little bit of a, a summary, a high level summary. Um, that these are the, the types of things that we need within construction to enable that uh, uh, transition. So from specialised to multidisciplinary operatives, creation of new roles like material scouts and urban miners. Um, innovative forms of learning and knowledge exchange and, and in enabling construction to embrace digital literacy is key. We need to upskill um, everybody at all levels, um, all sizes of companies, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and also drive demand for circular construction skills using public procurement. So making it, making it um, required please, you know, um, we, we, we need to drive, drive that demand. So yes, and the next slide is strengthening in the three value chains. So, so this is um, some of the high level implications of the three value chains, um, not just construction, um, that we need to, digital skills was, it, was it a key, key common component. Um, systems thinking around how we embed this into uh, the, the workforce, circular economy thinking, mindset, skills, knowledge, and so on. Promoting a uh, circular economy as a career destination. How do we um, make sure that the future workforce know what these kinds of roles are and, and, and how do we do that? Um, as I say, embedding it into existing education skills landscape. Um, uh, and just in introducing innovative forms of learning and knowledge exchange. I just want to add that the Scottish Government have just published a Climate Emergency Skills Action Plan in December 2020, which outlines the type of actions we'll need to enable us to transition to a net zero economy. And this, this Scottish Government plan does recognise that circular economy knowledge skills mindset are required to enable this to, to happen. So it's, a, it's an example of how national policy development needs to translate into regional and sector plans and how we need to uh, influence at, at all levels um, within that. Um, and we'll stop there. Um, thank you for listening. If you would like some more information on the, the research report, uh, we, we can um, provide that, get in touch with me, um, and uh, we, we, can, uh, we can answer questions if anybody reads it and, and would like to more, know more uh, about the work. But thank you very much for listening. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Fiona, for the presentation. And thank you also, Borja and Chris, uh, for those really clear and insightful presentations as well. Uh, I think it, it, it it, those uh, will inspire us to our next discussion. We are now actually to our panel and right after that to our Q&A session. Uh, I would like to remind our audience to post your questions at the bottom of the, of the screen in the, in the Q&A box and uh, also to direct your questions to one of our panelists, please. Uh, if any of your questions are not answered today, I would like to remind you also that uh, we will provide a follow-up note uh, with the main takeaways and uh, with our today's uh, most important question raised by, by the audience, so the, please do not worry. I want to start with uh, Catherine Stevens from Circular Planders. Um, Catherine, um, we have spoken about the unique characteristics and the strengths that subnational regions uh, may have. We also know that in order for education and training to keep up with the evolving demands and skills of the circular economy, that industry needs to work more closely. How do you approach this issue in Flanders and what kind of efforts are made 
to facilitate greater collaboration between industry and education. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, well, in our approach in Flanders, uh, while enhancing the circular economy, um, collaboration is really the key word. And nowadays we are putting uh, in place a new way of collaboration. Um, and Chris already mentioned it, we have now two ministers uh, who really take their responsibility, the Minister of Work uh, and Economy and the Minister of, Rhyme, of the Environment. And we work with a steering committee with uh, a diverse range of stakeholders um, uh, that we really want to get in action. But it's, it's five, uh, we, we talk about a pentagon um, because it's the government, it's the industry, but it's also civil society the knowledge and research um, uh, institutions and the financial world. So they um, are forming our steering committee. And then we are now tackling six um, teams and they won't come as a surprise because uh, in Scotland, it was already said the construction, a circular construction, chemistry and plastics, food, bioeconomy, manufacturing and water. So we defined six teams. And within these thematic agendas, um, the group involved is really challenged to work on seven topics. And we call them um, levers. Um, and the idea is take away barriers and um, taking uh, action, accelerating things, um, working on policy instruments that can be a barrier and has to have to be changed, working on finance, research, procurement, already said, also said as a really big enhancer, accelerator, entrepreneurship, and uh, community building, and, of, and also jobs and skills. So there I am. Uh, and in the approach now we have, uh, we really want to facilitate the dialogue between all the stakeholders, and we kind of structure it now, and uh, challenging uh, everybody to work on jobs and skills. Um, and we can say that it's now a real dynamic in Flanders um, uh, with a lot of people involved. But I wanted to add a kind of a personal note uh, and it's, it's exactly what actually Fiona already said. We also have to be aware of, of tunnel vision because if we then work on um, the construction, taking that as an example, and you, you really, we really want to look at competences that are needed in a circular construction uh, sector. But we, we must be aware of tunnel vision because I do believe that the challenge lies in looking at the transversal skills and looking over walls. And there's probably a better uh, expression in English, uh, but looking outside your own discipline, um, dealing with interdependence, having insight in, in following cycles of your product or material, um, being able to see potential and scenario thinking and the transversal skills, as we call them, uh, I think will be very important to tackle. And not just one on one to industry looking for construction, looking for uh, the plastic chemistry, looking for food, but, but really working on competences that looks multidisciplinary. So, um, Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Thank you, Katrina. I definitely agree with you in this uh, last part of, of, of the answer. Uh, now I would like to go with Etienne Engers from uh, RISEC Quebec. Uh, Etienne, um, one of the potential advantages uh, subnational regions can bring to the circular economy is facilitating the decentralization of resources and the sharing of resources and byproducts between companies. Could you tell us some more about how you are helping to transform uh, trash from one business to our resource for another industrial ecology projects in Quebec? And perhaps the tools, platforms, approaches you are using to facilitate this on a subnational level, please? Yeah, absolutely, Louis. So, uh, yeah, first we're working on different aspects of uh, circular economy here in Quebec for the last five years, but uh, industrial ecology was one of our big projects to put forward because we think it's the best uh, door to uh, bring circular economy inside of businesses. So uh, basically five years ago, there was not that much industrial ecology project in Quebec. 
but we did a funding program to put local animator in various regions to really be the link between businesses to transform trash to uh, resources. Um, but uh, seems simple, but the, the skill set needed for those animators are, uh, are really wide. So they need a soft skill like communication to get to people. Uh, they need to get trust from different companies they, because they will need access to sometime confidential data, share it with other regional partner to see uh, how to transform trash to uh, resources. They need to have a scientific knowledge to see if uh, concretely we can transform those resources with a different process. And they have to, they need as well a very good network uh, inside of the, the, the local region. So um, they weren't any certification or a university program specifically for those kind of jobs. So we had to uh, well, first launch the funding program. Uh, more than 15 projects were accepted, about 20 active uh, uh, animator at the time. Uh, so the first step we took is to uh, create um, a community of practice for all the animators to really help with the steep learning curve so they could uh, share tools, tips, uh, problems, challenges, uh, best case uh, scenarios and everything between themselves to really uh, share the knowledge and be sure they have all the tools the most quickly possible with one of our partner that is a technological transfer uh, center for uh, ecological uh, and industry. Um, second, after a year or two, we saw that there was a lot of interest in Quebec for the subject, uh, for the wider subject of circular economy. So we created with a different partner, um, uh, Circular Economy Hub, so Quebec Circular, a website where you can find, you can find all the information on industrial ecology, but on all the other uh, circular economy strategies. So really the one-stop shop to get the knowledge out to the different stakeholder and really to have uh, to put interest and help the local project to see you should do circular economy. Uh, circular economy, uh, you can go see example uh, tools uh, all around uh, Quebec to uh, put uh, with your local uh, reality. Um, and uh, then we uh, created with other partners as well, a research chair for uh, industrial ecology. So really to create tool uh, with the best data available to help all the local animator. Uh, so they can really uh, have ways to gather the data, to share it, to communicate very efficiently. So we are already in the second year of that chair and it's, uh, and it's doing great. We're really impressed with the tools and the, the knowledge that's going out of that. And last but not least, we're doing a second funding program that's just finished now to push forward for another three years, the local animators. So now we have about 50 animators and 22 projects. So it's very, very strong community. And it's very the, the door that we were looking for to uh, bring the other strategy of circular economy like uh, repair, uh, eco-design, refurbish, uh, functionality economy. So it's very the entrance door for uh, our vision uh, through the local region here. Thank you so much, Etienne. It's really, it's really interesting to hear like uh, this uh, set of activities that you are implementing right now and your uh, broad community. Uh, thank you, thank you so much. I would like to go now uh, with Zoe Lert from uh, Highlands and Iceland Enterprise. Uh, welcome, Zoe. Uh, my question for you is, uh, building on your experience in the Highlands and Islands region for, of Scotland. Can give some examples of how the region's natural resources could lead to a growth in job opportunities to accelerate the transition to the circular economy? Yes, I can. Thank you very much um, for having me. Uh, I just want to share a little bit of information about the region that I work in because um, it, I noticed that the number of different countries and different places that, are <clears throat> that have joined us today, so they may not be familiar. The Highlands and Islands region of Scotland is um, very, very rural and very low population density. So we have a population density of 12 people per square kilometre, just to give you a, a feel for that. And we also, within the region, have 93 islands, um, which are all um, populated, but they're all quite small populations as well. The region is surrounded by the sea and it's got a great deal of mountain and land resource within it. So we're not um, huge in terms of towns and cities, but we've got a lot of natural resources. 
And so I think from our perspective, the circular economy provides an opportunity um, to look at our rural jobs and our rural populations and to build that against the, the resources that we have in situ already. So um, just a few examples, we work very closely with businesses um, as an economic development agency, but we also work with uh, local communities who are very, very active in taking forward uh, their own initiatives and projects. And I think that the combination of the two, um, uh, supported by some research and, and other, other activities can be quite a powerful way um, to build a circular economy in a local place. So we call that place-based working. And I've just got a few examples building on our natural resources that I wanted to share today, just to give a flavor of, I think what's possible. We're at the start of the circular economy journey in the region. And I think, although there are some really good examples, I think there's a huge potential to go much, much further. So for example, one of the things our region is known for is community energy generation through wind farms. And some of these wind farms are now 10 years old. They've been fantastic at generating income for those communities to do all sorts of activities with. Um, but I'm aware of a company in part of the region that is now looking at refurbishing wind turbines for that next generation of wind farms. So I think that's a, a really good example in the um, capital equipment sort of basket. We also have a huge amount of forestry, the biggest area of forestry in, in the UK. And um, there's been a lot of in innovation in construction and um, for housing and for, for other buildings using forestry products. And some of that has been small scale, but some of those developers are starting to look at modular construction because one of the challenges is um, taking big heavy materials across onto islands, for example, is, can be quite expensive and difficult and makes it far too expensive to build housing. Um, but there's also new innovations in use of cross laminated timber. So we're gonna to start to get more value out of our timber resource locally. And that'll help us with a challenge we've got, which is a shortage of housing um, in the region. So those, those make not just a circular economy, but a circular society. Um, and then thirdly, I was going to give a couple of examples in the bioeconomy. Um, we have started to look and work with communities about uh, local food production. And we're doing a, a bit of feasibility work just now with seven communities in, in the Orkney Islands about um, the, the financial feasibility of micro uh, vertical farming projects. There's also some uh, covered horticulture projects where there's local food grown. But one of the interesting elements of the, of the project is that the communities are interested in looking at animal feed um, and growing local animal feed rather than bringing it from abroad. And that would help with our um, farming industry. Our, our, we do have quite good um, cattle and lamb farming industry. So that would decarbonize that and again, keep that waste local. And it feeds also into uh, the idea of anaerobic digestion, that I think Fiona mentioned. And then of course, drawing on our huge marine um, resource around our very significant coastline. I think we've got something like 90% of the UK's coastline in the area. Uh, we're starting to explore and experiment with seaweed cultivation, which can be used in a whole variety of different products. And so the value of that can increase. And the benefit of things like um, seaweed co cultivation is it would replace plastic film uh, as a food packaging process. And it's an area where it creates rural jobs for us. Um, it will grow populations that are fragile in those more remote areas. And it's using natural resources sustainably. So we're seeing a huge potential um, in terms of growth of rural jobs uh, based around circular economy principles. And we're quite excited to move on um, to develop that a bit further. Thank you so much, sorry for your answer. Um, I would like now to uh, open the microphone uh, for our audience. We have some uh, questions coming in. Uh, actually, I would like to, to invite in this moment uh, Stephen Lowy from University of Exeter in the UK. He has a question for you, Zoe. Uh, Stephen, would you like to open your, your microphone to unmute yourself? And make your... 
Uh, yeah, sure. I think you can probably hear me now. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Lewis, for inviting me to speak there. It's just a question from the UK experience, really. Um, and my question was about um, public services, and this was really brought up in the first talk. Um, and in the UK, we've seen quite an advancement of a of the sort of privatisation of public services, and and many feel that that's led to a prioritisation of short term goals uh, and profits over the services. And I wonder what the panel thought about that point and how that could potentially affect circular economy. Um, I I work in the, in Cornwall on a project called Tevi, and uh, and I think this is a, my in our experience, it's been a, a, a an issue which is more outside of London and more in sort of re, a regional level and. Uh, I'd be interested to hear what the uh, experience in Scotland have been uh, uh, around devolution around this issue and whether that's a potential solution to it. So that's my question to the panel. It's a bit of a long one, but hopefully it's fun. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Stephen. Please, uh, if, I, if anyone wants to jump in to answer this question, go ahead, please. I, I, can, I can give it a go. Sorry, here. Um, I think this is a really interesting and, and really challenging question, to be honest. Uh, I think there are, there are possibly opportunities in there, but I don't think to privatise or to have public ownership necessarily has to be the, the pivot point for, for change there. So um, I'm thinking of transport, which is a real challenge for us in, in uh, Scotland, especially when you've got inter-island transport. And, Couple of the, a couple of points, I think our ferry services are uneconomic, so we use government subsidies to, to make them work. But one of the things that's interesting when we're talking about remote communities and circular economies is um, they've been pretty active in, in energy generation. And we do know that there needs to be a fourfold increase in decarbonized energy to, to make sure that we meet our net zero targets for um, transport and for heat and so on. And I think that that one of the challenges in those communities having sufficient uh, decarbonized energy generation systems, if they're taking some control of that themselves, which they're very good at doing, is that with a low population density, the, the cost, the economics of that don't add up. But if they were able to um, do more with that, for example, by producing hydrogen, they could start to supply fuel for the ferries um, and that would start to change the cost model of the ferries. So it's not saying um, turn it into a public service, although in fact our ferries probably are more or less a public service. Um, it's just changing some of the inputs in the system uh, that make that a bit different and that yield an economic benefit for the local communities. So I, I probably seeing it more at a smaller scale than, uh, than our, our questioner. Thank you, so If uh, our other panelists all would also to add something here, please go ahead. If no, I have um, a question pointed to Etienne in this moment. It's from Felix Kaidot. Uh, Felix, if you want to unmute yourself and ask, your, ask the question, please. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, yeah, the question is for Etienne. Um, yeah, I work uh, for the CTDPE, uh, as this he mentioned uh, in his presentation, and I'm just, uh, I was wondering if uh, you have worked or if you're working on uh, converting the NACE code related to uh, circular economy into the SCIEN code related to circular economy, which is the North American classification. Yeah, bonjour, Félix. Donc, uh, so yeah, thanks for the question. Uh, we worked with uh, the Ministry of Economy here to uh, try to identify or classify uh, the different number related to circular economy. But uh, it's a kind of a tough job because circular economy is so wide. Uh, it's tough to really identify precise categories uh, to link it, but it's an ongoing work and we're looking forward to to uh, be able to get uh, more data from uh, from that field with the uh, circular economy uh, classification. Merci beaucoup. Thank you, Felix, and thank you, Ethan, for your answer. Uh, actually, I have another question for for Catherine. Um, 
Uh, Katrin, uh, drawing, drawing on your experience uh, in Flanders, uh, what can you tell us about the advantages that subnational regions may have in comparison to a national level when it comes to pushing forward circular jobs agenda? Do you see any issues uh, where the reinforcement of the national government might be necessary to move forward? Well, uh, I think uh, Chris already kind of explained that the structure in, in Belgium is quite complex, but um, we do, we, we, we in, in our region itself, we have a lot of um, tools in place to, to uh, enhance jobs and skills in the circular economy. And some things like uh, product uh, policy is federal. So I, I definitely believe in collaboration and um, strengthening each other um, with a national level. Um, but uh, at the moment, I really uh, am uh, looking at Europe too with a European skills agenda and the European Green Deal, uh, which hopefully will give this dynamic um, for, for the whole of Europe. And, and for Flanders, I think we, we look really at the European agenda, um, knowing that in Belgium itself, we have a st several instruments that really are federal, but um, well, yeah, the European, the European level for us is, is really one we're looking at now. Thank you, thank you, Katrin. Um, well, I have uh, another question uh, from uh, Rivana Bergman. This is for the panel in general. Uh, Rivana, if, if you want to mute yourself and ask, uh, and ask your question, please. Yes, hello, everyone. Um, I was interested in um, which incentives could uh, regions give to um, to push the demand for um, circular products? Because even though the products might uh, exist one day, hopefully, it is not uh, said that they are that they need to be uh, bought in the region itself. So maybe you have ideas about that. Thank you so much. If someone wants to start, please jump in. Go ahead. Uh, so, so here from uh, Highlands and Islands, um, within the region, we have a really strong base of social enterprises and we are periodically um, with other partners running campaigns about buying social, buying local and so on, which I think is starting to shift the balance in terms of demand. And although that's not directly circular economy, it, there's a really strong thread of that through the products that they sell. Uh, in addition to that, I think um, there are, obviously there's procurement from public bodies, which is, is one way, although our own public body doesn't really procure much. So some of that's quite hard to influence. But across Scotland, we're starting to see a lot of incentive for community wealth building and I think that that's recycling um, the local economy in a way so it's it's using local suppliers local goods etc cetera, etc cetera. and I think partly why I touched on natural resources was that our communities will get stronger by working with the materials they have closest to hand and if we're incorporating community wealth building and, and that 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 will promote the circularity of that that wider economy through that place. So I think there are different methods and techniques for doing that. And I think we have to be quite open-minded about um, using multiple multiple different methods to, to do that because we need to build momentum. Yeah, if I can add uh, to that. Um, here, I think we saw a shift with the COVID situation uh, here. Uh, buying local is uh, really going through the roof. So people are more and more interested to knowing where they buy stuff, uh, where it comes from. So um, especially with the COVID situation, there was lots of shortage here for masks, for uh, alcoholic soap. 
Um, so with all our uh, industrial ecology project, they really helped to uh, turn the production back to take alcohol from a brewery to make soap or uh, take uh, some used textile to make masks for the community. So uh, that was one of the great examples of uh, how a circular economy can really give tools and um, to, to address uh, procurement issue. Uh, but then to help regions to put forward um, to buy uh, those things, yes, to know their, uh, their local uh, businesses, very important, and really to have communication plan to uh, push forward the recycled content, for example, uh, to say that it's equal quality as new, uh, to be sure that consumer have the local aspect and the green aspect, and they know what, uh, why and why they're buy buying the stuff locally. So uh, listen to learn from the, the COVID on our side. Founders, we, we definitely believe in uh, public procurement as a real lever to make change happen. And we, uh, the last uh, two years, we have invested in a green deal on circular procurement. And nowadays, we're working in Flanders in the Interreg North Sea Region Project ProCirc um, because, well, it's now also joining forces uh, within Europe to get it also on a European level, higher on the agenda. But um, yeah, I think um, public procurement, I mean, for all the years I've been working in this field, uh, it is still being mentioned as, as a, a very important lever to make, make change happen. Um, and so in, in, in Flanders, definitely we are tackling that uh, too. I'm, I'm getting a notification that my, my sound was not good. <laughs> Sorry. No worries. Um, no worries, Catherine. Thank you so much for your answer. Yeah. I have uh, a final question to all our panelists. Uh, this one is, in, is related to social economy organizations. How um, social economy organizations can help to provide job positions to vulnerable groups, such as low educated people, women, youth population, underserved communities that commonly face barriers in accessing the mainstream labor market or job opportunities in traditional circular economy firms. How can subnational regions interact or cooperate with the social economy sector to make the labor market as it relates to the circular economy more, more inclusive? Yes, if I may, uh, Louis, uh, in Quebec, we're lucky to have a very active social economy um, crowd. Uh, so first, there's a lot of uh, communication around to buy from those uh, kind of businesses because they really help to be the, the usually the missing, missing link in circle, circular economy project. Um, as for a sorting center, reuse project, repair, uh, repurpose of building. Um, and we're just doing a study with uh, partners to see, uh, really identify the key sector where social economy meets circular economy, uh, see uh, what are the best business model um, that have the more impact, and then try to create a guide to uh, duplicate those, uh, those businesses from region to region and adapt it to the local reality. So for us, it's a very an important uh, piece of the puzzle to solve uh, the, the, the to, to circle uh, the, the different resources here yeah well i i think i can uh, will say the same thing that we we see the uh, involvement of social economy in a circular economy as a really uh, logical place for them to work in that's really um an economy in which for which they should adapt themselves in kind in words of training and, and being able to, to put put in work uh, for circular economy, uh, but we also really do believe in the local um, local level. So in Flanders, we are now uh, on a program, a subsidy program, in which we really uh, want to um, give support around new business models because it's not such an easy, an easy uh, cooperation. Um, yeah, there has to be trust in each other. Uh, for a regular business to make use of social economy. So that's, that's a challenge that has to be tackled. And uh, from, from government side, we really want to um, give um, 
will help help uh, finding those two the circular um, entrepreneur with the social economy companies yeah just Thank wanted you. to add that yeah. do you would you like to add something so um yeah similar um to Etienne and Catherine I think social um economy businesses are absolutely pivotal uh, because they have that broader interest um, that's not entirely about financial growth. Um, in our region, they're very strong, but I think um, some of the business models are probably where we need to support them to change because what we find is that when uh, women are underemployed, it's got more to do with access to childcare and working hours and the distance uh, from work and or childcare providers. And now that we're all working at home a lot more, some of that has opened up uh, differently and people are working different hours, which is great. So I think some of the barriers to inclusiveness around the circular economy are not, not so much about um, the, the business itself, but about the business model and the way it operates. Um, so that's something that we try to work quite hard on. We also have a lot of young people who are leaving the region and we want to retain them uh, working as they as they grow up and um, for that we are starting to do different initiatives around involving them in the social economy because they're the ones who are bringing like social economy values into work um, so we're trying to place them onto boards um, to help govern social economy businesses and things like that to to broaden out the way uh, those companies look at the the situation that they're in the context that they're in and the potential markets that they could be addressing so I think young people are quite a critical part of that picture as well. Absolutely, thank you so much, sorry. Um, I think we are running out of time, so it's it's moment to start wrapping up the, the event and start closing uh, the webinar. First of all, I would like to say thank you to our speakers and our panelists for such a fruitful discussion. And obviously also to our enthusiast audience uh, for their questions and their interest in this topic. Uh, if any of you would like to know more about uh, what we do in circular economy, uh, what we do in the Circular Jobs Initiative and also in close relation to our cities and business units, please explore our website. You can find the SCANS project that we have worked on in different regions and cities around the world. Um, you can also have a look at the tools we have available for you. We have uh, the Knowledge Hub where you can find different policy instruments and examples of case studies around the world. We have also the Circular Jobs Monitor uh, where you can find statistics related to, to, to circular jobs uh, for different regions and cities uh, worldwide. And finally, uh, an, an announcement. Uh, we have the launching of the Circularity Gap Report 2021 uh, the next week, uh, coming in the next week, the next Tuesday. 26th of January. So if you would like to, to join us, uh, it will be a really uh, great event. So uh, if you want uh, to know uh, how to get access to this event, uh, you will receive a follow-up note with, uh, with the slides of, of, of today's webinar, with a recording of, of, of the event as well, and also with the links to all these tools and reports that I already mentioned. Obviously also the the link to the event of, of the next week. Thank you so much, all of you, for being with us today and have a good day.